Hey everyone, it's Aminata Desert Rose, plant walker, firewoman, and I am here today with a very special guest, the Chaotic Forager, also known as Gabrielle Serbeville. Welcome, Gabrielle. Hi, thanks so much for having me. You are welcome. So um, people are probably wondering, what the hell is a Chaotic Forager? And I <laughs> promise you, I will get to that name. But first, Gabrielle, tell me, What's good for you today? Man, um, you know, today I woke up and I made tea and it was just very good tea. Um, and so I've just been sort of carrying that through my morning. <laughs> you know, it's it's always the little things that people say when I ask them that question on the show, you know. Mm -hmm. It's like Yeah. And it's just the perfect day for it. The temperature is lovely. It's kind of gray out it's it's just like a good day for fuzzy socks and a nice cup of tea mm. and i have to say you're one of the few people i know who would be like it's the perfect day when it's gray out for anything <laughs> you know most people i know are like give me sunny days so tell me about that how do you how are you, are you someone who appreciates all the seasons i really do um i I, I really appreciate seasonal change, um, especially those little sub seasons, you know, where it feels like spring, but also like summer or where it feels like fall, but it's starting to feel like winter and you just get those unique smells. Um, and I mean, as a forager, I'm always looking at um, I'm always looking at seasons based on like what's growing as opposed to like, what's the what does the month say that it is? So um, like right now, it's it's sort of the end of nut season. It's the end of fruit season. Um, everything's pretty much going to bed. And, you know, when I go outside, I can like smell people's campfires and uh, I can smell like rotting leaves. And it's just, I love this time of year so much. Wow. I, I just, I, <laughs> you love people's campfires and the smell of rotting <laughs> weeds and everything going to bed. Yeah, absolutely. There's just something, uh, it, there's something just really lovely about, um, the fact that the world is always changing around us. Um, even when, even when it feels like time is moving slowly, it never really is. You know, um, I just want to pick up on that. Um, here we are in the northern hemisphere. We're moving, heading into winter, as you said. You know, um, you look at what's going around rather than the month. And I, I want to head us to chaos because what you said, what you liked was, you know, when it's spring, but there's a little bit of summer in there or this fall and there's a little bit of winter in there. So tell me about, tell me about your name, the chaotic forager. <laughs> So my name actually uh, has changed since I started on social media. So when I started on social media, I used a screen name that I had used across a few other, uh, just like a few other websites. Um, I was the chaotic cat lady because I tend to bounce around with all these different interests and um, I can never just keep like one vein going in a conversation. And I also have two cats that I love very much. Uh, and I was working at a vet clinic at the time. So I was the chaotic cat lady. Um, and then over time, as I started making these foraging videos and the platform that I had had built was starting to grow more and more, it didn't make very much sense to be the chaotic cat lady anymore. But I realized that I had brought the chaos into my foraging. So I changed it to the chaotic forager. Um, and at the time, I was not on Instagram at all. Um, and I did well, not second. know. One oh. second, Gabrielle, I just want to let everyone know we met via Instagram. We met via Instagram. Yes. yes. So, <laughs> Gabrielle's one of the new people in my life. Um, who and I was saying to her at the beginning of the show that uh, I'm interested in people who are reaching for another a uh, fifth dimensional new earth consciousness, either through their practice or, you know, how they're being. And I sensed in her videos that this is a woman who has a relationship with the earth that is not in this current paradigm. So mm. continue. Yeah. So, um, you know, I wasn't on Instagram at the time. I was only on TikTok. Um, there was a very small, but very enthusiastic 
a community of foragers on TikTok and just a lot of people who wanted to learn. Um, I mean, I started at the beginning of the pandemic when nobody could go outside, like nobody could go out and be with other people in the ways that they were accustomed to. Everybody was sort of forced to stop and nobody was accustomed to doing that. Everybody was working. Everybody was going to school. Everybody was living their busy lives. And when they were forced to stop, and not allowed to leave their homes, not allowed to go to the grocery store or see their family or their friends, they, the only thing that you could do is look out your window. And when you looked out your window, the same window every single day for months and months, you started to notice that, hey, I have a tree in my backyard that I knew was there. I just never thought about it before. I wonder what that tree is. Hey, there's something growing over here. It smells kind of good. Oh, I have berries in my backyard. Can I eat those? And so people started asking these questions that they'd never had time to ask before. And so there was a community of us on TikTok who were very excited to answer those questions for people. And it became something that you could do even if you couldn't go out to a restaurant or go out to a movie with your friends. You could still go for a walk in a park. You could maybe even do a socially distanced hike with your friends because you could stay far enough apart. So um, it was a it was a kind of remarkable time to be an outdoor educator. Wow. OK, so we know that you forage and forage means that you go around. Uh, tell me what forage means to you. What definition yeah. would you use? <laughs> so um, to me, Foraging is a process or a, or a relational process of um, going out into a natural or unnatural environment with plants, fungi, whatever, and then collecting food or craft resources. So um, a lot of people think that in order to forage, you have to have a forest. You don't. You don't have to have a forest. I have many forager friends who live in New York City and forage on the city streets. Um, I I have a lot of friends who live in very urban areas. And at the time, I lived in an urban area and I did a lot of urban foraging. Um, so while I wouldn't forage everything in a city, there are many things that are safe to forage. And a lot of things that people plant in their landscaping as ornamentals are, are actually food. Agreed. Agreed. I was at my neighbor's uh, as an example, and she had lamb's ears. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Byzantium make lovely tea. The tops taste like pineapple. Wow. I'm, I'm so sad I missed out. <laughs> Get them again next year. And that is the beautiful thing about them is that, you know, these perennials as they come back and they're they're friends for us. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you are a chaotic forager. We know you're chaotic because you like change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you appreciate change. I need change. I thrive on change. Mm. I get I get too stuck if I have to just do one thing all the time. Mm -hmm. um, I've noticed that in my in the jobs that I take in the. Um, in the creative things that I do as a musician, I've noticed that in my foraging habits, um, I tend to not get stuck in routine mm -hmm. very easily. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And even with this kind of temperament, you've been able to um, build a business for yourself mm -hmm. as, as a quote unquote influencer. Um, and and I think that's amazing doing something that you love, you know, using platforms that are, you know, plus and minuses on these platforms, but you, you using it on the plus side. Mm -hmm. So, um, tell me about that a little bit. Like, even if you're someone who thrives on change and chaos, tell me about like, how do you make it work for you? Like, how do you make a, a practice or a business out of what you do online? It's a great question. Um, so I knew very early on that I was not going to be interested in 
doing a lot of things like selling merchandise. I didn't want something with my face on it. I didn't want to come up with stuff for people to buy so much. Uh, unless I knew that it was something that people were really asking for that would help them in their daily lives. Um, it's difficult to be an influencer who is trying to get you to buy less. Most influencers want you to buy more. And uh, so I, I field all of these like brand offers, sponsorships and things like that for like crap that I don't think people need. So I try to stick to, um, if I do take like a brand sponsorship, I try to stick to things that are services that people absolutely do need or that people will, will use every day. Give me um, an example. Give us an example. So one that I did was for um, Google Lens. So Google Lens is an app on your phone that can be used to um, narrow down a plant identification. You can also use it to identify other things in your life, but um, I've done a few ads for them where I show how to use the AI to help you identify something. Now, would you be able to identify something and then eat it? No, you'd have to do other things first to make sure that what you have is what the AI says that you have. But it's a great tool for beginners. It can jumpstart uh, your ability to find something in a field guide if you have no idea where to start. Um, you know, another example would be the cell surface that I use. I have an ad for my cell phone service uh, coming out because I use I use my phone all the time when I'm in the forest to navigate, to research things, to, um, you know, get into my community and uh, use like, um, like community science apps and things like that. So stuff like that I will do. Um, if you want me to like sell plastic crap that has been manufactured by people who aren't getting paid enough for it no I'm not going to do that and I'm never going to do that so yeah. it's just a it I have to be very very picky because it's not just about making money now it's about instilling trust in the things that I tell you are worth purchasing and the things that I won't tell you to purchase right um, and, and let me ask you this, because I've struggled mm -hmm. with this um, when I walk around with my phone or not my phone. Mm -hmm. So uh, because when I walk around with my phone, I could say, yes, I'm having it just in case. But mm -hmm. it becomes this um, tether to mm -hmm. uh, to to not the moment. It's a tether it to the next moment. So I wonder, how do you balance that? So when I'm out foraging and I, I have like a very specific goal or I just want to be out in nature because I don't just go outside to forage. I go outside because I am a part of nature and I need to like plug in. Um, I will turn my phone on to airplane mode because I don't want anybody interrupting me that doesn't need to be interrupting me. And then if I need to check my, I need to check my location or I need to look up and make sure that I have that scientific name right. Um, or I need to um, upload something to a uh, like a science community, um, then I'll turn off airplane mode and I'll do that. But it allows me to have my phone with me so that it's there when I need it, but it's not constantly pulling me out of the moment. Yeah, yeah. And um, I love that you you keep mentioned science community projects, and it just sounds mm -hmm. like you're you're plugged into some kind of larger community that you're serving. Tell me about that. Well, I, this is actually something that a ton of people are involved in, but um, I will often use an app called iNaturalist oh, uh, to, it. yeah, uh, and it's a community science effort that is uh, centered on uh, collecting observations from the public for scientists to then use in research. So it's pretty cool. Um, I don't use it as much as I should. My partner is actually very good with uploading things to iNaturalist. I, I have a huge backlog that I need to 
that I need to identify and upload. But it's a great project because if you don't know what something is, you can use their built-in AI to kind of help you narrow things down. But there's also this community of of like researchers and experts who will go through the observations that you upload and give you research grade identifications. And then researchers can actually pull specific data and use it to aid in their own research. Um, so it's a it's a huge uh, it's a huge thing and it's also just really great for for scientists. Yeah, it's like the the light side of AI. Yeah, it is. It's the <laughs> it's the thing that we should be using it for. <laughs> Instead of spying on us sur surreptitiously, we're like turning yeah. on consciously saying, "Hey, I want to share this with you." And or help. like stealing artists' work and stuff um, like that. Yeah, yeah. Well, we got to talk about arts, Gabrielle, because <laughs> I don't know how many people on the world know that you are a musician and that you're in a PhD program for um, music composition and computer technology. Yeah, I often joke that I got famous for the wrong thing, but I uh, <laughs> I got a I got my bachelor's degree in chaos, music composition. Chaos. It's chaos. It's all chaos. It's all connected. Um, I got my bachelor's in music composition from Butler University in 2014. And then I took a few years and I just worked. I just I freelanced. Um, I worked regular jobs. I worked at a vet clinic. I was a veterinary surgery assistant for a while. Um, I was an office manager. I did just all kinds of weird stuff. I worked in a in a Jewish community center as a babysitter. <laughs> I did all kinds of weird stuff. I was a Montessori teacher for a while. Um, and then in 2020, I decided that I was going to go back to school. So I got my master's at the uh, um, at Western Michigan University in Kalamazoo. And then I was uh, it in composition. It was. It was in composition. Um, and I had a great time there and that's really where I started to recognize that my musical practice needed to incorporate more nature. It needed to, that needed to really be the driving force behind my art. And it had been for a long time, but, um, that's really where I, where I started to see the path a little bit more. Um, so, and, so as opposed yeah. to them being two separate worlds, like the plant world, yeah. plant fungi world, and then there's music composition, you brought them together. I brought them together. Yeah. I okay. had experimented a little bit with that in 2017 uh, during an artist residency in Iceland, um, where I was really interested in... Did um, you just say Iceland? Yeah. I lived in Iceland for a few months in 2016, 2017. Uh, in the, and then I went the, back. Yeah. In the warm months? Oh no, in the cold ones. It was dark and it was cold and the wind is so cutting. It just eats through your bones, but it was it was beautiful. AKA why it's called Iceland. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, you hear the thing about, you know, Iceland is green and Greenland is icy and that's true, but Iceland is also very icy in the winter. Um, you know, feet of snow. It was it was quite an intense experience, but um, I started uh, really playing with my with my art there and playing with natural sounds, playing with yes. like, um, you know, field recordings, um, installation, these different ideas, because I'd had all of these different interests in like visual art and sculpture, but I was in a music composition program. And so I was learning about John Cage and I was learning about Yoko Ono and and I mean, all these um, 20th century musicians. And so it was really, uh, it was really fun to sort of step out of the academic music for a while and really think about what if I did this? What if I started playing with sculpture and creating more um, integrated art pieces that weren't necessarily all about the music, that were about the experience? So um, so that, I guess you could say that's really where that started, but then coming to uh, Michigan and re rebuilding a lot of what I had to leave behind in Indiana, uh, cause I had to find all new foraging spots. I had to get to know the local area. I, it was really, it was really just a time of, of massive discovery. 
Um, and then I stayed in Michigan for an extra year after graduating with my master's, um, applied to different programs, ended up here at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville, Virginia. And now I live in the Shenandoah Valley and it is a beautiful place and I get to kind of do it all over again. You know, now I'm finding new spots again. I'm uh, exploring uh, a different environment. You know, I moved from the mid the Midwest to the Mid Atlantic, so there are different things that grow here. There are different growing seasons. Um, it's really just kind of remarkable to uh, to experience so many different parts of the world and to figure out what wants to be created and what can be found here. Yeah. So, okay. So this thing about, um, let's talk about this music and sounds and I think you called it bio data. Mm, did yeah. You call it bio data. I did. Yep. Um, how would you say what you're doing, what you're learning is like blowing up our conception of music or is blowing up our conception of, you know, nature like sure yeah so something that i think um is is probably true for for most of us is when we think about music we are recognizing that there is a person who is trying to tell us something through the creation of that music um, they are using pitches and rhythms and all of these different aspects of of sound that we call music to uh, to communicate something to us. And I am less interested in telling an audience something through constructed sound. I am more interested in allowing an audience allowing participants to experience what nature has to tell us so um one of the ways that i like to do that is by um a process of biodata collection so i will use small devices uh, i'm using one called a plant wave right now that you've probably seen on instagram or facebook or something um, it's just a small device uh you know about the size of your palm and what it does is it picks up the electrical signals given off by living things um, by creating a circuit so you've either got two little little clips or you have two little tens pads like the sticky pads they put on you in the hospital Mm -hmm. um, so you create a circuit by placing them on or in a mushroom or a plant. Um, the device translates, uh, collects those electrical signals and in real time translates them into MIDI, which is a musical computer language. And then from there, I can take that MIDI data and I can assign it to synthesizers. I can assign it to um drum pads i can do anything with it in order to oh. um let the data speak, speak. Mm -hmm. yeah so what about if you put those little pads or those little pinchers on people because we are all emitting mm -hmm. are, so are, we, yeah. are we emitting like what are we electronic pulses what are we emitting mm -hmm. give me the language so um typically it's it's referred to as galvanic response um and so it's just like kind of proof of life if you will um and we have it anything that's alive has it i actually took a couple tens pads and i stuck them on my cat's toe beans um and he did not like it but i did get cool sounds from from his from his little feet uh it was very cute so yeah we're if you're alive, your body is going to prove that through like your pulse, through electrical impulses. Um, the surface of your skin is just full of electrical impulses, um, something that you might like even call like your your personal vibration. So I recently brought my master's thesis work, my my big work to uh, a conference in Ohio. Um, it's a piece I call Fungal Chapel. So it uses biodata uh, from mushrooms. Um, 
and they're like on an altar. There are also some sounding sculptures that I built because I love to weld. I love to work with wood. Um, and one is like an offertory. So that you, you go find something from nature and you offer it to the installation and it becomes part of the installation forever. Um, there's another water pouring exercise and it's all amplified. So it makes really beautiful sounds. It's just this meditative experience, but I took it to a music composition conference. And so everybody was just really interested in how the mushroom thing worked. And it was without <laughs> wait, fail. Wait, wait. <laughs> <laughs> because you were at a music conference, everybody was interested in the mushrooms, not the water. What do you mean? Everybody, Why is uh, because I had, uh, you know, all the cool technology, you know, I had my little, my little plant wave hooked up to the mushrooms and they were like, how is this working? Like what's going on here? Um, and without fail, all of them would remove the clips from the mushrooms. And when you do that, you're holding them in your hands and you're, you are now the thing that's being sonified and they would hear the change in what they sounded like versus what the mushrooms sounded like. And it was always just super fun to see that kind of come over their faces. Like I had no idea that I could sound like this. Uh, so it was really fun. Do people sound good? Do they sound discordant? Do they vary? It varies. Um, you know, a person who just came in from a run is going to produce a lot more data for me to play with than somebody who's been sitting on the couch playing a video game. What about someone who's been meditating versus someone mm. who's sitting on a couch? I would assume that it would be similar, but maybe even less. Mm. I'll have to I'll have to test that. You've given me uh, you've given me something new to to play with. Well, the reason why I ask is because uh, one of the things for me that's that we have an opportunity for this time of year being heading into winter is rest, more rest, mm -hmm. more rest and more rest than we normally think we can afford to do. Uh, and I was just saying, but resting isn't Netflix binging or, mm -hmm. you know, it's it's something it's, it's pulling your attention. Well, yeah, and it's pulling your attention back, actually, you know, it's like retracting all that mm -hmm. outward attention and even closing the eyes into uh, another kind of attention. You know, I've heard it said, and I agree, I agree with this, that resting is work. And I think it's because it, it takes effort to rest, uh, to rest effectively. Mm -hmm. um, it's also something that I struggle with because I am somebody who likes to be moving all the time. Um, I get an idea and I want to go do it right away. You know, I, I decided two days ago that I want to paint my living room and all I can think about is how much I want to paint my living room. And I want to like, go get this paint and do it right now. But I was just sick and my body needs to, needs to rest. I don't need to be going out to the hardware store. I don't need to be getting up on a ladder and painting my living room right now. So it's, uh, it's always a challenge for me to pause to like center myself to even just like download all of the data that has been accumulating in my head for days or weeks or months you know from the last time that i truly rested uh it's it's challenging but but it is important because otherwise you just slowly lose your mind I i'm wondering about this because you use the term download the data <laughs> so Tell us, what does downloading the data look like? I think for me, uh, when I'm in the midst of a project or an idea, um, it's very difficult for me to, um, to be in my body all the time. Um, and I really need to be intentional about it. Or I'll realize that I've been very out of touch with myself for a long time. Um, and I've definitely had that happen before. And I think that it's good to have specific time where you don't have anything that needs to be done. You don't have a task that needs to be accomplished. And you just sort of reflect on everything that you have already done. Everything that you needed to sit down and think about or needed to sit down and process so maybe it's less downloading maybe it's more just processing mm. um 
you know, our lives are so busy uh, and my life is super busy because I'm self-employed. I'm in a PhD program. I'm writing a book. I have got, I have so many things that I have to be doing all the time, but I also, um, I also found that when I started writing my book, uh, all of my thoughts were just such a huge jumble that I needed to sit down with them for a while and actually think about like, what is going to go on this page? Like what is in my mind right now? How can I, how can I make order of this? Um, and so having intentional time where, where I'm not doing something, uh, and my, my job is to sit and process and put things back in order in my head is important. Mm, Yeah. Yeah. And I can see how, just how it would, it could take support. So for anybody out there who's chaotic, you know, who has a tendency toward movement, you know, that's a space that you're comfortable in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I could see how stillness could need something. Mm -hmm. Mm. Absolutely. I wanted to ask you about as, you know what, let's take a break. It's been so good having you here. I have a couple more questions for you, but let's go ahead and take a break and we'll come right back. Perfect. Perfect. 